For the latest COVID-19 news and updates, visit Hartford HealthCare's coronavirus website. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with uh, Paul and Josh, and I have uh, two special guests I'll introduce in a minute who represent great eateries here in the state of Connecticut. And as you know, um, starting next week, May 20th, we're going to be um, doing partial reopenings of our restaurants for outdoor eating. I just want to hear um, two perspectives on that from folks who are in the legislature and also know a lot about uh, fine dining. Uh, tomorrow, as you know, is our day where we'll have um, the Reopen Connecticut Committee give an update on where we are um, now one week out from our May 20th uh, opening date. I just figured I'd take a minute to tell you about um, Moody's Analytics. We are on the uh, call uh, this afternoon with um, uh, all of the governors, and, uh, and they brought in Moody's Analytics to give us an idea of uh, what the fiscal situation was for the states as uh, the House and the Senate now are thinking about what the next supplemental uh, should look like. And uh, Moody's Analytics was pretty interesting as they looked at a stress test of all the different states. And they said, look, most of the states uh, were in reasonably good shape in anticipation of a normal recession. I would say that Connecticut was in better shape than most in anticipation of a normal recession. But uh, this was no normal recession. As you know, our uh, unemployment claims spiked up 20 times compared to a similar period during uh, the last recession. And the fiscal shock on average for states is about 20%. That means their revenues are down about 20% from what they had budgeted. And that's across the board. But there's incredible variation between the states, which I just wanted to talk to you about for a minute, because I thought you might find it interesting. Two big variables about what hit states uh, the hardest. One is the volatility of their income. And, uh, and Moody's Analytics said there are two main variables there. Number one, in terms of your source of revenues, uh, the progressivity or how steep your income tax is, that can lead to, um, you know, a fair amount of variability there. And that hits, you know, New York and New Jersey a little bit harder, Connecticut a little bit less, and some other states uh, a lot less. And the other big variable is in source of income is energy. You know, I hadn't really focused on the fact that, that um, you know, Wyoming and Alaska and uh, North Dakota get a significant amount of their state budget paid for by taxes on energy. So in the case of Alaska, their revenues are down about 60%. In the case of Wyoming, they're down about 30%. You know, big gaps in terms of uh, what they'd expected and what they're getting. Another um, big variable is on the revenue side is also the nature of your economy and how it's set up. And uh, there are those states that rely, uh, again, on energy got hit the most. Those that uh, rely on a tourism got hit, and you can imagine why. Uh, aviation is down quite a bit. No, everybody's discouraging travel, hotels. We don't even have hotels open here uh, for outside occupancy, and places like far Florida are down about 24% in terms of uh, their expected revenues. Big shortfalls. And uh, one reason I, I mention that is because um, you've heard some of the comments as we think about a supplemental and how we help uh, the states going forward is it's blue states and red states, and the blue states aren't managing each themselves nearly as well as the red states. Well, in fact, you're going to find if you go through Moody's analytics that it's um, Wyoming, Alaska, Florida, Louisiana um, are the states that are hit in many cases by far the hardest you know, given the sources of uh, revenues and income they have, which I think is why I'm, you know, hopeful that we'll get some sort of a responsible supplemental through that allows us to get through this without having to uh, raise taxes or um, cut spending dramatically. Um, Connecticut's also in a better shape compared to our peers because um, a lot of our core industries kept going. These are core industries that do well in bad times as well as good. Healthcare uh, being one. Education, we'll see, but right now education is still um, a good driver for us. Manufacturing, as you know, we never did close uh, manufacturing. And right now they're uh, working at a pretty good throttle, although um, Pratt & Whitney, because of commercial jet engines, had to furlough some people. But this gives us a fair amount of stability compared to uh, a lot of our peers. 
And finally, um, we had a rainy day fund, which represented, you know, 12 or 13 percent of our overall um, budget. You know, that, that didn't put us at the top of the heap, but it put us in the top 10, and uh, that was very helpful for us. Um, who's at the top of the heap? I can tell you that um, in terms of rainy day funds, uh, Wyoming has a rainy day fund that was 140 percent of their overall budget. So. Um, that's because uh, they have, it's like a sovereign wealth fund from Saudi Arabia. They, they have a lot of reserves from uh, energy, but they needed it because they're so volatile going forward. Um, Alaska had a, a, a rainy day fund, which is 85% of their total budget. We're about 13%, but that still put us near the top. So overall, Moody's gave um, Connecticut a pretty good record. They said because of the rainy day fund, because of uh, the nature of your revenues um, being relatively stable compared to a lot of your peers, because you didn't close down as much of the economy, manufacturing, healthcare, education, for example, finance, uh, were better able to power through than some of our peers. But um, I really wanted to leave you with a message that it's so important that um, some sort of a supplemental come through, and I hope they reach a compromise. You know, with that, I can just tell you briefly on the daily summary you see here, um, the numbers just continued the same trend we've had now for, um, you know, two, three weeks. Um, positive cases uh, spiked up a little bit. That's not a number that's meaningful in my mind by itself. It's meaningful as a percentage of the tests performed, and it looks to me like they're a little over 10 percent this uh, time, but still overall a downward trend. Fatalities uh, went up a little bit, and hospitalizations continue to go down, a key metric. You'll see on the next chart that um, hospitalizations are a key metric for um, the reopening uh, is now going on, what is it, almost three weeks of continue continuity, which is very important. And you'll see that the positive uh, test day-to-day -day in terms of uh, the infection rate is on a downward trend as well. But um, what this economy means to us is fundamental to um, how we get it reopened. And I've always maintained that we're never going to get reopened and give the consumer confidence to go back to that store, to that um, salon, to that restaurant, unless they feel like we're putting um, public health front and center. And that's why we've tried to strike the right balance in terms of how we start reopening on um, next week, one week from today. And as long as the metrics continue on the trend they are, uh, we'll be able to do that. And with that, I just really wanted to introduce uh, two friends with uh, perhaps slightly different perspectives on reopening. Um, we can talk about salons. We can talk about um, the service industry. I really wanted to talk about restaurants. And as you know, we're opening up restaurants just for outside eating only um, starting uh, next week. One of the first states in the region to do that alongside um, Maine, I think, and Rhode Island and a few of the other states, but not everybody is doing it. And some people think we should do it more aggressively. Some people think we ought to maybe be a little more cautious. So I've got um, Senators Paul Formica and Christine Cohen, each of whom are uh, great friends who uh, have fabulous restaurants. And I can't remember what order we said. So um, Paul, since um, let me just start with you. Flanders Fish Market, one of the great places to go, East Lime. Uh, I think I recommend it strongly. I've been there before, and uh, Paul will tell you a little bit about what his plans are going forward. And Paul, by the way, barbershops do open up in about a week. Paul Formica. You, you can tell I need that barbershop, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, sir, and thank you uh, very much for all that you're doing and your team uh, during this unprecedented time in our state's history. Uh, Thank you, too, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts today. Uh, our leaders and legislators statewide stand ready uh, to provide their input and assistance uh, in this recovery. Uh, it was uh, March 17th that we had to reinvent our restaurant business to best accommodate the health and safety of our customers and staff during this pandemic. We have a fairly large restaurant with a retail component and an established takeout service. Uh, we've closed rooms and turned off refrigerators and freezers and have done whatever we can to reduce costs to survive uh, during this time. Our revenues are down significantly, but we are holding our own due to the fact that we have the greatest staff in the business and our support from our 
our great customers. We started to offer curbside and delivery service to enhance our customer base. And the move to outside dining will be good for our customers to enjoy our products in a relaxed and safe environment. I have a deck and other outside space on our property to put tables out there. Uh, the forecast for the next seven days, however, includes four days of rain. So while this may be a prudent and measured start, there are many restaurants, both large and small, that solely outside dining is not going to work for. Uh, our industry needs to get our staffs working together. Again, we need to support the food supply chain as our wholesalers and distributors have suffered along with us and restarting large fishing vessels, meat packers, and paper and produce companies will take some time. The opening of our beaches from Coscob to Stonington, rental units, museums, all or portions of hotels and casinos will dictate the number of people we will be asked to serve. We need to trust the great businesses and entrepreneurs that are the job producers of our great state to make their decision about opening their business and providing jobs and let them have the ability to open their businesses thoughtfully, professionally, and safely. Our nursing homes are overrun with infections and the priority needs to continue to be to manage that better, to protect our residents and our great frontline health providers. I believe we can balance our physical health and our economic health in a way that is safe. Opening a restaurant or any business now is not the way, the same as it used to be. We need to recreate and develop new processes to manage people movement and product distribution. We need to ensure everyone has access to adequate levels of masks, gloves, and cleaners to sustain a seven-day operation. And we will need to be vigilant to quick changes in crowd size, product availability, and virus containment including education to uh, all of us for our collective personal responsibilities to keep ourselves safe. I know I speak for our entire industry when I say we are ready for this challenge and look forward to collaborating with all of you to achieve our statewide recovery. And uh, once again, Governor, I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to join all of you today and all of the great work you're doing. And, uh, you know, we've been in the state a long time and we want to be in the state a lot longer and we support um, all of our industry and all of the great industries that we need to open up. Well, Senator, thank you, Senator Formica. I really appreciate that. And we'll talk a little more about the balance of uh, as we get these things opened and how you're doing it thoughtfully at Flanders Fish Market. Uh, Senator Christine Cohen, um, I hear you've got the best bagels uh, in Connecticut, not just Madison. <laughs> thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you for invi inviting me to join you today. Um, I do believe that uh, both Senator Formica and I come at this from a unique perspective, not only as state legislators, uh, but as longtime small business owners. And I just want to start, um, as Senator Formica said, uh, echo some of his comments and give you and your team uh, kudos for handling uh, this unusual situ situation uh, for which there is certainly no guidebook. Um, I'm in the quick serve casual industry, and while my revenues have dropped significantly, my husband and I are so fortunate that we've been able to keep our doors open and our team members employed. It's far from easy, but we're making it work also without a handbook on best practices. Um, so for the most part, things have gone well. Our local health department has been a great partner, and our company and customers have been able to adapt to a new way of conducting business. We quickly contracted with an online operation to allow for us to take orders remotely and ensure minimal contact. Our employees all wear masks and uh, certainly the gloves, which are frequently changed, and customers are given a pickup time and rather than entering our store, their bag is passed out onto a table upon arrival or perhaps brought out to their car. Um, and while no method is perfect, and we had to, in fact, send a message to our customers this past weekend to really be mindful of social distancing and uh, to please wear masks, which brings to light 
uh, a new burden on businesses as they think about reopening, uh, which is how do we do business um, and police others? Um, we now have to be concerned for our employee safety as well as our patrons, and what does that look like for us? I had a business owner ask me uh, this earlier this week, um, you know, on a weekly call that I have with businesses, whether they could refuse service to a customer for not wearing a mask. And these are all good questions. And I know you, Governor, uh, have received some thoughts on enforcement as well. Uh, customer comf comfort levels are going to be dependent on other patrons' behavior to an extent we have not seen before. So now not only do restaurateurs and retail establishments need to be concerned with having superior customer service, cleanliness, and great products, now we also have to become extremely concerned with how other customers are behaving in terms of their own safety protocols. Um, we've just not experienced anything like this before. Um, I've been on a weekly call, as I said, with our Shoreline Chamber and local businesses from across the district. Businesses are incredibly appreciative of what the state and federal government have done in terms of providing assistance, certainly grateful for EIDL and PPP, as well as the bridge loan from the state, pandemic unemployment assistance. In terms of reopening, while many want to see a path forward, there is also significant concerns that I'm hearing that really run the gamut. Uh, I think we're all hearing them. You know, will my employees come back to me um, you know, after receiving a significant unemployment check. Uh, my PPP's kicked in, but I'm not able to open yet. Um, am I going to be able to find the sanitizer and PPP, PPE necessary to reopen? Um, and, you know, worries about child care and daycare. Um, will the revenues be enough to sustain this new business model that we're all operating under? And will customers come back? Because certainly there is still a lot of fear um, and, and questions about what if things go awry? Where does that leave us? I had a Facebook Live last week with uh, Commissioner David Lehman of DECD. We had a terrific conversation, but it's clear that we need to be smart and methodical about this and take baby steps under the guidance of trusted healthcare profess professionals such as Dr. Ko. Um, I've been out of my house very little, with the exception of a co couple of uh, very well socially distanced press conferences, my daily outdoor exercise, and to ensure I'm supporting local business. My family and I have been getting food from our local farm grocer and ordering out from local eateries because we know these businesses, the low margins under which they operate, and the fact that they truly are the backbone of our economy. If there's one thing that I'd like to leave folks with today, it's this. Please, please continue to socially distance, as the governor has directed. Please, please wear your masks when you go into establishments, and please, please support small businesses by purchasing gift cards for future use or ordering takeout from restaurants that are operating. While much of Connecticut's economy hasn't shut down, the smaller percentage of the GDP greatly needs your help for their future survival. So with that, Governor, I'll turn it back over to you. Christine, Paul, thank you very much. I think the message is clear. We've got to support our local restaurants. Well, right now you're doing it by takeout. Starting May 20th, you can do it by takeout as well as eating outside uh, there. Uh, with that, um, Max, happy to take any questions. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Hi, Governor. Um, what is the date for the second phase of the reopening? Um, I anticipate uh, in and around June 20th. Uh, it seems to me that we're going to do this um, phase one on May 20th. We have uh, two or three weeks where you get an idea of um, what the effects have been. Are there any flare-ups or people um, following the protocols that Christine described so well? And that will give us some good insights as we focus on uh, June 20th and give people a little bit of notice beforehand. So do you have uh, an idea of, of what type of business you might be looking to reopen on June 20th then? Well, I think um, Paul would be pretty interested in seeing if we can do some indoor dining uh, by June 20th or before <laughs> that. So those are the different steps we have along the way, yes. 
Okay. And the other question I had was um, the um, plastic bag tax was suspended um, in one of your uh, first executive orders. Uh, is the plastic bag tax at grocery stores going to be coming back? Yeah, my understanding is uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, you know, during the height of things, we didn't want all that touch going on, but I think um, I think it's as of May 15th. I can't remember what the date is. Uh, the tax goes back. Yeah, well, okay. what we're going to uh, do is the, the, that tax will come back um, uh, over time. We are uh, working with uh, the industry and, and the environmentalists uh, on it, so we should actually have some different uh, some details uh, about uh, the development for that uh, most likely tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thank you. Um, Governor, are you going to address the issue of business liability uh, before the uh, opening on May 20th? Yeah, we've been talking about we have been talking about that quite a bit, Paul, and um, that's one of the reasons that um, David Lehman worked closely with the Restaurant Association and other associations, as well as OSHA, as well as uh, employee groups, to make sure we put in place a clear set of protocols where if you follow those protocols, uh, you shouldn't be liable. If you don't follow those protocols, maybe you should be. Okay. And to the two senators, uh, do you think your uh, businesses should have to wait to June 20th to open up the indoor dining, or do you think you could do that safely on May 20th or sometime uh, before June 20th? I'm, I, I'm happy to answer. I, you know, from my standpoint, I'm um, extremely concerned. I will tell you that we actually closed our indoor dining prior to being told to do so um, because we were concerned about our customers and our employee safety. That being said, and I don't know what my decision will be going forward in terms of indoor dining, um, I'm also concerned for restaurants. And as I said, um, you know, they, I know the low revenues under which they operate especially uh, with the inability to open up bars um, and bar seating. Um, so, I, you know, it's a conundrum, and I think public health uh, is paramount, and we need to follow the guidance of our health care professionals. Well, I think public health is, is uh, primarily what we need to worry about, and giving us a, a, a few weeks to understand the difference in moving crowds uh, in and out of our uh, restaurant areas uh, with outside dining uh, and then kind of gauge the impact on, uh, you know, the health numbers as we move forward, I think is a good thing. Uh, a lot of industry professionals came out uh, with a letter earlier today to asking for June 3rd uh, as a date. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can be at least open uh, to having those discussions that uh, June 3rd might be an acceptable date for the industry uh, and give us time to work our way through the the opportunities to understand what this new normal is going to look like. And uh, Governor, um, your executive order last night uh, allows uh, food trucks uh, to be, I guess, uh, bars and restaurants to. Um, well, I guess I'm. Just, I guess my question is, does the provision in your ex executive order regarding food trucks is that going to allow breweries and bars to open up back to the public by simply having uh, a taco truck or a pizza truck or a Thai food truck uh, outside their establishments? You know that, Paul? Yeah. It, 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 simply the, the answer is yes. Um, we wanted to make sure that if, for that out, outside drinking that it had to be accompanied with food. And so for breweries who reached out, uh, many of whom don't serve food, but they have food trucks as part of their overall, um, I would say, establishment by inviting food trucks in. So that's, so in short answer, Paul, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you very much. The day of New London. Uh, hello, uh, uh, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask you about, about the letter that uh, Senator Formica just referenced, um, what your reaction was to it specifically. That this group, I guess, uh, most of the folks are with the Connecticut Restaurant Association. And they're suggesting that 50% uh, capacity indoors could be allowed as of June 30th, excuse me, as of June 3. 
And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what your response to that is. And and, and for uh, Senator Formica, this is Brian Hollenbeck. Paul, how are you? I just wanted to ask uh, what your what your uh, expectation is among customers. Um, We've done some informer polling that shows uh, only about 25% of the people are eager or can't wait to get back into uh, to eating out because of, of the health concerns. And I'm wondering um, what you might be finding. Well, I'll start with that, Paul. Um, look, I, I'm going to err on the side of caution. Um, I, I think uh, we are one of the uh, earlier states to allow outside dining. Why outside, not inside? You're 90% uh, more likely to get um, catch the infection inside than you are outside, following even the, some of the best protocols. I think we're going to get the inside dining, but I think it's not simply a matter of the state saying, um, you know, June 20th. It's also a matter of giving the consumers confidence. You know, they'll go to um, Flanders Fish Market a couple times. They'll see uh, that um, the waiters are wearing masks. They're using proper hygiene. Everything's six feet apart. And I think over a period of amount of time, at that point, they'll be more comfortable to go inside as well. So it's simply not our dictate. It's also the consumers. But I think uh, let's err on the side of caution here. Yeah, Brian, I agree uh, with the governor. Uh, I don't want to give up July and August for a hurried opening, uh, but it's up to people to take personal responsibility. Uh, you know, if we're going to make this, if we're going to make this work. You know, in our restaurant, we've been taking temperatures of our staff every shift and providing masks and gloves. Uh, you know, long before the requirement came out, uh, just to make sure that we're safe. And I think we go forward. But as long as we're open to, to analyzing the numbers as they come through after May 20th and, and you know, take a look at June 3rd and, and not say absolutely out of the question because it's a date, uh, let's proceed cautiously. Uh, and if it's uh, health, healthy and uh, safe to open up, then, then I think we can open up. And whether it's 50% capacity or 25 or whatever the number is, you know, I think as long as we have the great entrepreneurial spirit of the state of Connecticut at the table, uh, I think we'll be able to work collaboratively to get our economy moving again. And you, and you think the response is going to be there as of uh, June 20th? Uh, there's enough demand that people are going to feel comfortable enough uh, that you're going to have uh, all the business you can handle? You know, one would hope, but people have to make their own decisions. And, and uh, you know, this is not anything that we've ever encountered uh, in the history of our state, I don't think. so. Uh, you know, we just have to go forward and let people uh, go. Our job is to serve our customers, uh, and uh, we'll serve it whatever way they best want to be served. And, and that's how I treat it. I'm sure Senator Cohen does the same. Thank you. The Associated Press. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Sue Haig. Uh, Governor, the, uh, the chairman of the state Republicans today is um, criticizing the decision of the, by the administration to hire a Boston consulting firm. He says that it's, he's calling it reckless spending and brought up the fact that Indra Nui uh, worked for them. Uh, and he wants you to uh, actually replace this group with a, a regional group of uh, officials to try to come up with reopening plan. I wonder, can you talk a little bit about why this consulting company is needed? And is it uh, $2 million that's being spent? Um, Boston Consulting Group is really focused on this as a consulting expertise. They're doing this for Connecticut, for Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts. So they are the glue that helps us think about how, as a region, we're going to do this, and we can learn best practices from each and every one of our neighboring states. As you know, we are working together as a consortium. And uh, as um, the Reopen uh, Connecticut team winds down, the Boston Consulting Group is going to help us on all those same metrics, be it on testing, uh, be it on the protocols opening up so we can collect the best information from all of the other um, uh, companies and practices in the region and learn from it. I think it's, um, look, we could do an RFP process so we could get the responses in 60 days and we could uh, uh, interpret it for a while or we can get going. And what I hear from uh, small businesses across the state is uh, I want to get going in a prudent and thoughtful way. And I thought this was a prudent and thoughtful way to proceed. And is that $2 million figure correct? 
uh, given the scope of the work, that is uh, probably what we're going to estimate it's going to cost. And by the way, it's worth noting it is paid for by the federal government. It's, it's a COVID-related expense, which is the way my neighboring states are doing this as well. We're going to learn a lot by working together on this. And did your test results come back yet, sir? Yeah, I'm okay. Thanks for asking. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hearst Connecticut Media. Thanks, Max. Um, Governor, um, is the 84 deaths today a catch-up number, or is, that, is it just this nasty bump that has occurred in one day? Got a thought on that, Josh? Yeah, I mean, the data is always what's reported to us in the last 24 hours, so, you know, it's, it could be a mix, but we don't have the breakdown. Thanks. Um, and, Josh, have, have any nursing home fines been le levied yet? Um, I, I'll have to get back to you on that. I know there's um, some uh, findings that have been published recently. Um, we, can, we can get you the data on that. Okay, and you're going to do the deaths, uh, uh, the nursing home deaths totals tomorrow. tomorrow, yes? That's correct. Thanks. Um, hey, Governor, so we've got the restaurants opening up uh, soon, and are, are you expecting that all employees are going to be tested uh, by then, um, I mean, you're going to have all the 42,000 a week tests available. Who's going to be getting tested? Well, that was not one of the core requirements that I know of for the restaurants to do this. Um, but I can tell you a lot of companies are taking it upon themselves to test their employees, uh, A, for the safety of the employees, and also just to give their customers a great deal of confidence as well. Just, yeah, just to add to that. So well, shouldn't they, they the shouldn't they then? We have the capacity for anyone who's symptomatic to get tested, and we encourage them strongly to do so. Um, the testing strategy that we, we have in place that we're executing to that we've reviewed a couple times in this format, though, focuses on the most at-risk populations, so people working in nursing homes, uh, nursing home residents, in our corrections facilities, um, first responders, healthcare workers, and people in, in uh, at-risk communities in some of our bigger cities. So that's really the testing strategy and how we're looking to prioritize, but as um, you know, certainly anyone who works in a restaurant or anywhere else, if they have symptoms, they're absolutely encouraged to uh, go get tested. And I can Thank tell you. Paul and Christine that we did get 100,000 thermal thermometers uh, in our warehouse the other day. So if you feel like uh, testing people on their way in, I think it's not a bad thing to do. We can help you out with that. Well, thank you, Governor. We have a laser thermometer that we've been taking our temperatures of our staff every shift. And, uh, you know, maybe we can expand that to customers. But, you know, we're, we're mindful because of the great serve safe program that all restaurants are expected to, to have a serve safe coordinator on site. Uh, you know, we're, we're very versed in, in health and safety. And um, people that don't feel well shouldn't come in long before this virus if you're handling food. So, we're more mindful of it now. Fair enough. The Hartford Current. Hi, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you plan to enforce the social distancing guidelines for businesses opening on May 20th? Will they be actively enforced, or will business be monitoring themselves? I think the same way we did the uh, safe stores, same way we did the safe workplaces, uh, which is, um, I think a lot of customers are in there telling uh, proprietors uh, you're not following the protocols. I think some employees are there telling uh, proprietors if they're not following the protocols. They're telling uh, their neighbors if there's a, a clump of people where you ought to be uh, socially distanced. And if they don't feel comfortable doing that, then give us a call. We've got uh, the 211 exchange and we can uh, get people out there to remind the proprietor that the rules are the rules. The Connecticut Mirror. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, the two casinos are certainly working on their own reopening strategy and timing. Um, nobody is, is talking about jumping the May 20th uh, deadline. But what is, um, what is the best advice th that you are getting from your committee as to what would be a safe opening time for the two casinos? Not now. Uh, I've talked to um, the casinos, I'm talking to my fellow governors, um, but right now it does seem to me that uh, restaurants are a big piece of casino life. Uh, obviously we don't like indoor dining uh, and bar activity, 
Uh, we do uh, worry about the fact that it attracts a lot of people from the greater region or even out of state. A lot of folks over the age of 65 who I think ought to be staying at home, should be staying at home, must be staying at home, attracted as well. So I don't think it should be in this early tranche. Um, they're looking at sometime in June. I mean, they're not committed to any particular time, but they're looking at what other casinos in other parts of the country are doing. Does that strike you as premature, or is that something that is uh, potentially safe in your view? It strikes me as premature, Paz, but um, I've got to sit down and talk to the sovereign nation. And that was my third question. Um, they are sovereign nations. Is that your view, that you are in a position to use the bully pulpit and give your best advice to them as opposed to dictating? Well, you know me. I like to try and work through anything I can on a collaborative way, but I do feel pretty strongly that it's too early to open up uh, big casinos, gathering places, folks coming in from outside. It's, uh, it's too early. And should it be done in concert with New York? Uh, because that's going to be, uh, I know you, it's been a general concern of yours of, of doing things in concert with the other states. Is there anything about casinos that make, that make you more sensitive to it, it being done on a regional basis? Yeah, absolutely, Paz. I mean, the idea that um, we would potentially open early and people have an incentive to drive up from New York or drive down from Massachusetts is the opposite of everything we're trying to accomplish. We want people to stay uh, stay local. All right, and the last thing, the, did your administration get any further information? Uh, Yale put out uh, news today that they're getting some more cases of that childhood inflammatory disease. Uh, do you have anything to add to what is going on uh, with that syndrome? Do you have any new on that, Josh? The I don't, one, I don't. The, well, the one thing I, I will say that is um, today, uh, DPH uh, sent out an alert about the pediatric uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, they sent this out uh, to all the Connecticut pediatric health systems to make sure that they're reporting if these cases are occurring uh, in their facilities or if they have cases so we can be able to track it and handle it accordingly and work with not only our regional partners but our federal partners. So this is now a trackable um, illness uh, right now in the state of Connecticut. All right, thank you all. And uh, Senator, if you're looking for votes, I would say keep the goatee. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Connecticut Public Media. Ali Wachowski for WNPR. We've tried to get a hard number from your office on how many COVID-19 tests the state is capable of conducting right now. Do we have that number? And if not, can you explain? explain why pinning an upper limit to the state's current testing capacity is difficult. Yeah, so it, the, the number is growing by the day um, as we add more lab testing partners. It is currently well in excess of the 42,000 target for next week and we're um, working on building additional capacity to uh, look forward into June in a phase two uh, target as, as the governor mentioned earlier. So we're, we're very well positioned in terms of capacity as we've talked about I think as recently as yesterday. The real challenge is getting out to people to get tested. The people in those high risk groups I described and certainly encouraging everybody who has any symptoms or any concerns to go get tested because that's how we can help ensure we, uh, we prevent any further flare ups in the future. Okay, so I just want to confirm, the goal was to have 42,000 tests, and we already have that goal as of today. Yeah, we've, we've more than exceeded that goal today. Okay, and based on the data so far, what would you estimate is the high water mark right now for how many tests the state can conduct in a given day? From a laboratory capacity perspective, as I mentioned, we're, we're well in excess of 42,000, um, well above that. Um, in terms of the sample collection, as I said, that's the piece that we're working on to continue to build up. Boceto Media. WTIC 1080 News. All right, for Paul and Christine, deep down, how confident are you that indoor dining will be safe? We've seen enough evidence, I think, at this point that most of the breakouts are happening in, 
are happening in very tight neighborhoods, in jails, meatpacking plants, in, you know, the people in Wisconsin who were forced to vote. There are a lot of cases out of that. How confident can we be, or do you need more evidence to be confident on indoor dining? Well, I, I think, you know, as the governor said earlier, you are much more likely to contract and spread the virus indoors than outdoors. Uh, and we need to be paying attention to that. And I also think um, businesses need to recognize that um, customer fear um, will not be waylaid if other uh, customers and patrons aren't following the safety protocols that are uh, put in place. So we, we need to recognize all of this as we take uh, those baby steps forward uh, and, and really figure this out. Yeah, we need, to, we need to measure it. And I think a good rule of thumb is that, you know, most restaurant owners work in the restaurant. And so, you know, they're not going to want to do anything that's not safe for them and their staff to move forward. And, and uh, so I think it's incumbent upon uh, personal responsibility for customers coming in, personal responsibilities for employee, employers, employees, even delivery drivers. Uh, everybody's got to, you know, take control of their own personal space and I think if we can do that, we can make it work. There, there are large crowds walking through big box uh, stores that, uh, you know, come and go and people, you know, get close to each other there. So uh, we just have to measure it. We have to be cautious and we have to make sure that no matter what we do, health and safety is first. And Mr. Governor, same kind of question regarding schools. Have you heard from a lot of parents? Um, there's a lot of folks saying, you know, open the schools. We've got to get that going. But there's no parent that wants their kid to be a guinea pig on something like this. When it comes to opening the schools, you're saying? Well, we've, yeah. been, we've been pretty strict. We're not obviously opening the schools between now and June 30. Uh, we're thinking cautiously about opening up summer camps in July because that's outside, a smaller group than you have in a classroom. Similar situation for summer schools as we try and ramp back up, hoping that September is, is a safe date. But as you point out, um, we're watching carefully. We, we'll be able to make a determination um, you know, later on this summer that it's a go date in September. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, a question for our two senators uh, who also happen to be business owners. What's been the biggest challenge um, in getting to that May 20th date to reopen, or in your case, Senator Cohen, into staying open? Well, I, I think as I, you know, as I've said, um, most people are um, following all the safety protocols. They're wearing masks when they come to pick up their orders. Uh, my team ha is uh, changing their gloves reg regularly. We have uh, cleaning protocols in place, making sure that uh, nobody's sick coming to work, as Senator Formica uh, pointed out. Um, so I, I think we're ready. Um, again, it remains to be seen whether I will open up outdoor tables for dining. Um, I, I think um, I'm hearing from a lot of restaurants as well, it, though we heard from um, several from the Restaurant Association today in a letter to the governor. I'm hearing from others who are very concerned about a May 20th opening date. They're concerned. Um, you know, some of the things I mentioned a little bit earlier, but concerned with getting the proper equipment in time, having the PPE available for their employees, making sure that they have the sanitizer and the cleaning wipes available, making sure they have those uh, plexiglass divides uh, at cashiers and cash registers, having a touchless payment option. Um, and so these are, these are all concerns that restaurants face. Um, and I, I just reiterate again, as uh, both the governor and Senator Formica have pointed out, that public health needs to be paramount in all of this. And I think restaurateurs and customers alike just want to know uh, from our healthcare professionals that we're moving in the right direction at the right time. You know, thank you, and I, I agree with the, with the good senator. Uh, you know, every business, whether you're a hair salon or a nail salon or a restaurant, you know, you make the choice to open, uh, you know, irrespective of whatever guidelines are there. It's your business. Uh, we have, you know, done all the plexiglass uh, stuff and the protections and protecting our staff, as you heard me say before. And I think I will treat um, takeout in the beginning 
Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I will treat outside dining in the beginning as a takeout environment. I'm not going to put a lot of servers out there the first few days and, and, and do that. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to treat it as a takeout. People can take it outside and back their car up next to the picnic table and, uh, you know, enjoy a lunch. And, and we'll have plenty of garbage receptacles out there to pick up the stuff. And, and we'll be able to see. You know, I have a philosophy that we've used in our restaurant with our great managers over the years. We've been there. We call it management by walking around. And that's the only way that you can really understand what goes on in your place. And we're going to do a lot of that to make sure that we're keeping up on uh, all of the things we do to make sure that health is first uh, and then the customer experience. And Governor, you know, you've been in touch with a lot of these business owners. Are you getting a sense of how many are actually expecting to or planning on reopening on the 20th? Not all of them. I mean, I know a lot of them are a little more cautious. A lot of them want more time to get it right. A lot of them are waiting on customers and see what the demand is. A lot of them are, um, you know, talking to employees, making sure they feel comfortable to get back. So May 20th is not going to be a light switch that turns on. I think it will phase in over a period of time. And, Governor, you know, we heard Senator Formica earlier say that, you know, his business is is going to really be dictated about the number of people that they serve. That's going to be coming from the beaches, from the short-term vacation rentals. And on that point, the short-term vacation rentals, do you think that we could see them back open this summer? And if so, what would that hinge on? Well, it wouldn't be uh, phase one. Uh, we'd look at it uh, for later on. Obviously, uh, we, we did what we did with the hotels and the short-term rentals. Again, like we talked about with the casinos, we didn't want a lot of cross-border traffic, people driving all over the region. That was particularly true when New York City was on fire or uh, Boston was um, running hot. Now that's uh, more stable and more uniform around the area, so we'll be able to take a look at that in stage two or three, absolutely. News 12, Connecticut. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. Uh, I have a question for Josh. You mentioned a committee put together by DPH of dentists and hygienists would be meeting today. What new mandates or decisions, if any, came out of that meeting today? Yes, so we had uh, the DPH team hosted a, a two and a half hour meeting that included dental hygienists, dentists, um, I believe the head of the University of Bridgeport Dental School and other experts. And the consensus was, uh, was a very good meeting and that they're very close to having agreements on a set of conditions under which um, uh, dental procedures, uh, including routine screenings, could proceed and protections that hygienists would have to be able to hold their employer accountable to ensure that the proper PPE is available and that their safety is going to be protected. But we expect to hear more. They're trading drafts and we hope to have something finalized uh, by the end of the week. Thank you. And then, Governor, Mayor Bill de Blasio mentioned potentially reopening the New York City's restaurants in three stages, but dates are up in the air. I know you said you want people to stay local, but since New York is right next door, are you anticipating an influx of people coming to Connecticut starting next Wednesday as we reopen our restaurants? Well, I'm going to watch, watch that like a hawk. I think that's a very good question. As you know, we um, closed our restaurants and bars in conjunction with our neighboring states, in particular New York. Uh, we're doing just outside dining, and uh, we're talking to New York as well as Rhode Island, which is doing their outside dining at the same time, to see what else we can do on a regional basis, because you're right, we don't want a lot of traffic back and forth. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. Wondering if you're able to give us a little bit more of a preview of phase two besides the indoor dining. What else might be included? Potentially gyms? Uh, potentially gyms. Um, I think more in terms of the outside activities. Um, I had a lot of people that said, um, boy, could we do a graduation? It, uh, let's complete the uh, school year for we high school seniors. And I thought, okay, well, Maybe not in June, it's still too early. We're still uh, working our way through this. Maybe that's the type of thing we see opening up in, uh, in July or August. Uh, weddings and uh, other events where you can do outside. Those would be more likely my priorities, but I'm um, gonna get the final report from the reopen committee in about a week so I can report back in more detail. 
And then also just in terms of the testing, there's been some reports today about the Abbott test and some concerns about false negatives. Have you guys been aware of those reports? I believe that test is being used down in New Haven. Yeah, we're, we're aware of the studies. We're monitoring them carefully, um, both in terms of whether the, some of those false negatives are as a result of sampling error or the actual um, laboratory processing as well. So we're keeping a close eye on that, but um, no, no changes at this time. That, by the way, that Abbott test is a very small percentage of the overall testing that's going on in the state right now. News 8. For Cohen Bagels, how is your business done? Has it hurt? Has it gone up? Because, of, uh, you know, you can't serve fish to go as easily as you could a bagel, your bacon, egg, and cheese. How is your business done? Yeah, well, I, thanks for that question. And, you know, I alluded to this at the beginning of the press conference that I'm grateful that we are in sort of a quick serve industry, which uh, probably is faring a lot better uh, than some of your, like, fine dining establishments and uh, even uh, Senator Firmica's uh, model of business, although he does have do a lot of takeout and has a fish market. Um, so I we've done fairly well our revenues are down at the beginning they were down by 50 percent uh they're down a little less at this point uh people are starting to feel a bit more comfortable about going out and the process that we have in place and the safety measures that we've taken and governor have you been getting takeout and how do you feel about it when you go to get takeout if you do when will i go for takeout i'm gonna go so, um, have you done takeout have you done takeout already? Yeah, I do a little bit less at the uh, governor's residence, to tell you the truth. But uh, at home, all I can figure out is that we have a kitchen there in Greenwich is made for takeout, so we open it up in the kitchen and serve. So we do a lot of takeout. By the way, I will just say that almost every, I'll just say almost every Saturday for the last eight years, my wife is at Cohen's Bagels picking up bagels on a Saturday morning. So I can personally attest to the, uh, how outstanding the bagels are at Cohen's. <laughs> uh, couldn't couldn't uh, resist. <laughs> oh, uh, and, and I hate to even bring this up, but there was a protest out front, uh, nursing home workers still saying about the PPE. Is there a disconnect? Because we see you in the warehouses with all this PPE, and they're saying they have not issued a gown on Monday, and they don't get a new gown uh, for a whole week. They get a new gown every Monday. Is this just a couple of them, or is this? have you heard about this? I, I don't know. I know we had the biggest shipment, I think, in the entire region. We got a 60-day supply. Um, look, the not-for-profits, uh, in this case, the nursing homes, uh, they're responsible for the PPE, and we're there as a backup for them, so there's no excuse not to get the gowns and the masks that uh, these frontline workers deserve. We have the capacity. Thank you. All right, I'm getting the signal. I think that was uh, the last question. I just like to say um, two things. I heard about the testing and the capacity. Um, go to go to the drive-through test in New Haven. You can get an appointment anytime you want to. We have a lot of testing capacity there. It's a good thing to do, and um, it's easy to do, and it's uh, in part your civic responsibility to get tested so we know where you stand. It took me a while. I did it. It's not that bad. It's worth doing. And I, you know, the testing is sort of a bridge to the vaccinations and the such. We've had that a conversation before. And I was just a little surprised to hear the American Academy of Pediatrics say there are fewer kids today getting vaccinated than they were before the pandemic, and there were fewer than um, last year as well. And vaccinations only work if uh, people take the vaccinations. Our hospitals are open. Go see your primary care physician. It's the right thing to do. And I'll just uh, leave our two guests with the thought that um, I'm going to get maybe a lock from Paul Formica's uh, Flanders Fish Market and put it on a uh, Christine Cohen bagel, and I'm looking forward to that day very much. Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you. Appreciate you guys being here.